Um, you know, I, right out of college, a uh, bachelor's degree, I got into law enforcement. I did that for uh, seven years. And um, I had the kind of the idea from that point to, to start a crime scene cleanup company in 2005. Uh, so I did that and, you know, grew quite slowly. And then in 2016, I decided to franchise the company. And, um, you know, here we are in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, we've been able to, you know, grow the company. And, uh, you know, the third year we were in uh, the Entrepreneur Franchise 500. And uh, this year we just made uh, Inc. 5000 um, in number 768. So uh, something like that. So, you know, it's been a fantastic year for growth for us. Uh, you know, we just signed our 36th franchisee today. So uh, we're growing pretty quickly and uh, we're super excited about it. So, you know, I was uh, 19 years old and um, I, I had uh, no relationship with my family. It was, it was always very stressed. Uh, there was no, you know, common ground there. We didn't get along. Um, so I was effectively on my own, uh, you know, right when I uh, graduated high school. So uh, I knew that I would have to go into the military to be able to pay for college. So I knew that if I gave them four years, they would literally give me the GI Bill and it would pay for everything. Mm -hmm. So I was never one of those people that, you know, uh, when I grow up, I want to be, you know, a career in the military. It, for me, it was a means to an end. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I thought I can do anything for four years if, if they'll give me that, you know, that money. So I, I enlisted in, uh, in the army. I was looking at all the branches and, uh, the, uh, the Marine Corps required five years. And I thought, well, why would I do five when I can do four and I'm still getting the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that was really the only difference, uh, why I chose the army over the Marine Corps. And, uh, the Navy was never an option. I have no desire to be on a boat for six months at a time. So uh, I went in and um, this was 1994. I was, uh, you know, no family support. I literally had to break into my parents' house to uh, steal my birth certificate just so I could enlist because I didn't even have that. So uh, I got my birth certificate. That's what they needed and uh, went through everything, got into basic training. And I actually liked it a lot. I thought it was very challenging and I was learning such cool things that I would have never learned anywhere else, you know, and probably will never use again, like, you know, how driving Humvees and uh, setting up Claymore mines. And I had never shot a gun before. So that was my first time doing all that. So I found it very interesting. Um, this was during the time in 1994, uh, Bill Clinton had just passed the don't ask, don't tell policy. And that really, when he passed that, it gave me a false confidence that I was gonna be okay because I thought, that was my protection. Don't ask, don't tell, don't pursue. They couldn't pursue. So I had this false confidence that I was going to be okay. I just, you just keep your mouth shut. You do your four years and you move on. So uh, it, when I was in uh, my unit, there was, uh, pro, there was 28 women out of uh, four or 500. There wasn't a lot. And uh, we were all housed in, in different barracks. And it was a uh, giant open barracks. Like there was a cot every two feet. So it was one of those type of things. And so, the, you know, you're in, ba you're in basic training. There's, there's no privacy or anything like that. So at the end of basic training, um, I, we started getting called in to um, the higher ranking people and they were interrogating us. And I didn't know what it was at the time, but looking back, it was a witch hunt. So they were calling each one of us in individually and asking who the gay soldiers were. Mm. And uh, we're in basic training, we're 19 years old, and they were intimidating these girls. And they would push them and pressure them. So a lot of them would just dime out names without any evidence. You know, that was never something that was discussed without any evidence or, or anything like that. So they ended up getting three of us and me being one of them. And uh, I'll never forget, so they, uh, they charge you. It's, it's an actual crime. They charge you with, a, with an Article 15. Um, and the, the uh, penalty of it is five years in prison. So they gave uh, me, I don't know about the other two, they gave me a, an ultimatum of just get out and leave the chance and go to trial. If you lose, you get five years 
locked in prison. Wow. So initially, uh, you know, being defiant as I usually am, I said, no, I'm not going to take the deal. Well, then they give you a military appointed lawyer. So, <laughs> you know, that's like a black man being a, a jury full of KKK members. Okay. Right. So I didn't stand a freaking chance. Okay. So I was like, okay, now I see how you guys are going to stack. Um, you know, and I have parents, no family, nothing. And I'll never forget um, my friends pressuring me, call your parents, call your parents, see if they'll pay for a civilian lawyer. And I'll never forget, I called my parents and they were taken off guard and they didn't even know I was in the military uh, in another state. And I said, I need a lawyer. And they said, for what? And I said, well, they're, you know, they're charging me with being gay. And I'll never forget my mother says, well, are you? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, then you deserve it. Oh. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. That stabs so you I was in the like, heart. well, that went well. <laughs> yeah. That went well. Yeah. Johnny Cochran's on his way over, right? Oh. So, yeah, that didn't work out so good. So needless to say, I knew the, the, the odds were against me. So I just took the, the discharge, not really understanding what that meant. So I'm going through the the, pro, the exit process, which is quite lengthy. There's a medical, uh, they stripped all the clothes off of us and uh, put us back in civilian clothes and we lost everything that we had, right? Uh, they give you a one-way plane ticket and then they gave me a stack of paperwork, uh, which uh, on the plane I look through and there is a discharge paper and it's stamped homosexual on the discharge paper and I thought that's really a thing like what happened to the don't ask don't tell you know and all this kind of stuff so needless to say um when I was going back and applying for jobs the question on the application is have you ever been in the military and I said yes and they said Re uh, reason for discharge and I put it there and I got denied for every single job I applied for so I called that military lawyer up and I said, I can't get a job. And he said, you were only in the service for six months. Don't put that you were ever in. Hmm. So it's I said, lie. okay. Yeah. So I did it and he was right. Got hired by the first place. You know, um, I think that defiant 18, 19 year old uh, is kind of what I was trying to prove something. So they, they weren't gonna help me. No one was gonna help me with, with college or getting there or whatever. So my, my, my goal was, okay, I'll, I'll essentially torture myself for the, the next four years so that I can, I can get this college degree. You know, you think that's, that's everything. And um, when that got derailed, I thought, I'm screwed. I really thought that. So what I learned from that was you have to pivot. You ha it, life is going to take you down a different road than what you planned. And you can sit there and, you know, get up in the fetal position and cry about it. Or you can pivot and take the other road and see where that takes you. Mm -hmm. So when I got discharged, I thought, I'm screwed. I have no way to get a job and I have no money. And now I, I still have no education. So essentially, I put myself in a worse position than where I was originally. Um, but what I did is I literally put a map of the United States on the wall and I threw a dart and it landed on Knoxville, Tennessee. And that's where I went in college. Wow. Yeah. I lived there for one year so I could get residency. And then I took out loans for the rest of it. And I worked two jobs while I was going to school and it taught me resilience. And, you know, looking back on that, all of these events that you know, individually would be catastrophic, but collectively, it's almost, it almost takes my breath away when I really think about it, how uh, compact they all happened within, you know, four or five years. Um, but looking now, all of these things happened for me, not to me. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it created where I am today. And now when, you know, the shit hits the fan, so to speak, I look, look at it and go, well, that ain't nothing compared to what I was at before. Right. You know, um, homeless, 19, nowhere, you know, with a, a discharge paper that was essentially the scarlet letter. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the military was not 
kind to my community at all. And, you know, I don't know how it is today, but it, w it was bad enough that they were, you know, trying to discharge us based on an interrogation of rumors. But what was even worse is they paraded us around and called us the chapter 13s. So uh, that's, the, that's the chapter for, for that particular discharge. So what it, it's essentially, what I look at it is, what's the difference between that and forcing the black community to drink out of a different fountain? It's mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah, It's yeah. the same thing. That It was just 1994 as opposed to 1960. Mm -hmm. um, well, <laughs> and it wasn't, I don't want to make it seem like it was easy and that no. I just, you know, was defiant because I'll tell you, there was many times where I was beat up badly mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you just got to take a minute or a week and sit back and think how can mm -hmm. I pivot and how can I go a different direction because clearly life is not sending me this way I was mm -hmm. not meant to do my four years there I was meant to pivot and have a different experience and I probably wouldn't have had that experience if I hadn't have had the negative experience of the military but you know it I still cringe to this day when I hear members of the gay community say, I wanna go in the military and I cringe because I'm like, listen, I don't know how the atmosphere is now, but I can tell you that shit was bad back mm -hmm. then. You know, yeah. it was really, really bad. Mm -hmm. So, this is incredible what you went through, not just not having your family support, but even uh, being rejected there. Uh, and then being in an environment where you thought you were safe and clearly you weren't safe to that then setting a precedent to, to uh, being rejected for jobs. But you're on the other side of that now. We're a successful franchisor. Um, what did you learn through that, those obstacles, those struggles? What did you learn and what gift came out of that kind of a struggle? Wow. Yeah, it's remarkable, but I think it's so important to talk about this because you have younger generations who have it easier, mm -hmm. uh, don't always remember that they do. <laughs> yeah. And, and to know that things have changed and things are changing. And even if they don't, they still face discrimination. They still face hardship. Yes. Every single one of, you know, our kids go through different things, but to know that you can, you're just like the inner 